and welcome, and sorry for the slight delay, um, but uh, <laughs> this room, I don't know if you can really see that, but this room is now just a mess of wires and everything with different computers doing different things and hopefully streaming to you live now. Give me a thumbs up if you're seeing that and um, it's live, okay? Just feeding the gorillas, I like your style, Adam. All right, um, loads for you today, and this has been requested loads of times. The main kind of theme is how to decode and um, how to structure your long written questions. So I'm going to go through that in loads of detail. I've got loads of examples for both GCSE and A-level. Now I encourage you, if you're A-level, to just sit through the GCSE bits first because I'm going to establish the kind of principle that you're going to apply to the A-level questions as well. The GCSE bit won't take too long. If you're GCSE here, and um, well, very warm welcome. I'm going to do some questions from some different exam boards today. And I've got an Educast one, I believe, and uh, an Edexcel one. And I've put um, some playlists down in the description as well, which go through some questions, some examples from OCR for GCSE. And I have an AQA playlist coming soon for paper two, which is just after half term for you guys. For the A level, there's some examples from Edexcel in the description, and I've got an Educast and an Edexcel longer written question example. And then what I've got for you after that is how to use exemplars and examiner's reports, which I think is one of the most useful ways that you can prepare yourself for the exams. Okay, so I really hope this is going to be useful to you. Without further ado, I'm going to jump into the kind of uh, the visualizer just now. Um, just remember that I will stop and do chat in between the little parts. So I'm going to look at one part. Then I'll stop and do the chat. If you're watching this recorded, then great, welcome. But um, it will be useful to be live because then you can ask your questions and get those things from the chat. If you're watching this recorded, though, you need to be subscribed to make sure that you do see me when I go live. And um, I'm really looking forward to getting 10K subscribers. So hopefully you can help me by sharing this out with your mates just now, just while I go into the first little bit, just while I do this whole spiel. And um, help me get to 10K subscribers because then I'll get the community tab and I'll be able to be really much more useful for everybody out there. Okay, um, I will stop for the chat. As I said, if you're watching this recorded, you might want to just skip the five kind of minutes of chat that I'll do in between the kind of main modules. Or you might want to see what types of questions people are asking. There's been some really useful thing. And this idea for today's has come from people asking for it. Come from people asking for um, how to do written questions. Because most of you seem pretty confident with your algebra and your calculations. But written questions in physics, not so much. Okay, without further ado, let's jump on into... Here comes the gorilla sound. So jump on into the visual. Okay, so... Um, this is my kind of tips on how to, well this is calculation questions, right? this is my methodology. I think you have to tackle calculation questions differently from written questions. I think that's quite an important thing. Um, but they both follow the same kind of idea, which is kind of identify what the, the problem is and then go ahead and solve the problem. So um, they're both a kind of similar kind of idea. But um, in this case, uh, firstly, you are, You'll be familiar with this. Find the data that you've got. Identify the data you've got. Think about what you're trying to calculate. Check what the units are. This goes for GCSE and A level. They're always going to be trying to trick you up with your unit skills. Select your equation, okay, or remember it if you're in GCSE, and rearrange it into the right form. Then you put the data in. Then you do the calculation. And then the last thing you do is check your answer. Importantly, the coherence of the units. So most of you kind of, if you follow that kind of step by step, what data have you got? What do you need to calculate? What equation? Rearrange, calculate, check. If you do that, you're going to do pretty well on calculation questions. Now, really, written um, answers aren't that different, okay? But you just need to have a kind of methodology for that, so you can get through calculation questions on pretty much just on methodology, okay? Um, and here we go for the written. This is the methodology that I would suggest that you follow. Now, here's what I um, strongly suggest: you underline the command words. People say underline key terms, but everything is really important in an exam question. Every word they've selected to put in an exam question is really important to give you a clue on what the answer should be. So, um, if you underline the command words, it gives you a clue on what kind of level of response that you need to do, and it allows you to check back a little bit better because you're going to be, you're going to check back to the things they've asked you to do. And every mark on the mark scheme is going to be linked in some way to a command word to do that. Then you have to apply your knowledge, and that's the bit where people get uh, stuck at first, is actually, well, all right, they've given me this context, but what about the, um, you know, what part of the physics syllabus am I supposed to apply to this? If they just ask me a question, 
on F equals MA. I'd know that. If they asked me, if they said state Newton's second law, I could do that. But where in this question do I realise that it's a Newton's second law question, for example? And then this bit is the most important part for today, really. Okay, well, longer written ones, it's about planning. And this is the bit that people kind of skip and they go straight in to actually just going ahead and starting writing. And then they realise, oh no, I've, I've written kind of nothing of any kind of consequence and I've filled up this space and I'm in a bit of a panic and now I'm asking for more paper and um, how am I going to do this question, right? So this planning part is really important. It might be diagrams. Okay, do you need a diagram? Is it useful to have a diagram to um, in your answer? Definitely for the longer written ones, the six markers we sometimes call them, but now we like to call them level of response marked questions instead. Okay, structured writing, extended writing, whatever your exam board calls them. Definitely paragraphs. Okay, and definitely for all, even the short response written ones, think about the sequence, what makes sense. So the pl this part, the planning, is the bit we're going to focus on a lot today. And also... Then you just write it, you've planned it, so you just write it. And then the last thing to do is check. And I've underlined check because I've underlined command words. So you always check back the command words. Okay, so um, these are the, the important parts that we're going to come back to. Okay, planning and checking. So getting from the question to a kind of idea of what you should write and what the best kind of order that you should write that in is and then checking with the question, using the question, checking how, um, checking if you've covered everything you should cover. Right, really quick um, look into the, do you, do you want the jump scare again, guys? Or, well, I'm not either, you're watching slightly, <laughs> slightly delayed, so I'll give you this one, which uh, it's got uh, some nice music. And we'll have a quick look at the chat before we jump into this first question. Yeah, audio is sometimes out of sync, unfortunately, um, on live streams. It's normally synced up again after they've processed it. So there's not a lot I can do about that, really, um, unfortunately. It's not It's not on my end. It's actually just the live feed. Um, so sorry about that. Hope, But when I put the notes up um, on the visualizer, then it won't matter too much about you know whether you're reading my lips or anything, because it'd be what I'm talking about. Uh, why gorillas? Okay, well, all right, if you want the whole story... Um, I look a bit like a gorilla. I've basically been a bit interested by gorillas. I was going to say obsessed. A little bit interested by gorillas my whole life. Okay, you're not looking at the visualizer at the minute. This is at a Gary the gorilla. Um, I look a bit like a gorilla, I guess. Loads of people want to comment on my hairstyle. How's my hair looking right now? Um, but it's just it's just a name for the channel. That's all. It's nothing to do with anything really. Um, I like gorillas. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Just feeding the gorillas. Be right back. Could you put up the notes? Yeah, for the notes from the CPAC video. I'm I'm going to do a really good web page for them, right? But what I've got for you in the meantime, and the notes for the CPAC video is I've got the playlist for core practicals, which is in the description now. So I know that mainly core practicals are going to come up in um, paper three um, for all of you. I'm going to put that as a web page, and they'll be up there um, as well. A little bit more on that later, and. Um, now it's synced again apparently okay and right thanks then let's let's go back into it now because I'm sure there'll be more questions a little bit later on so um, let's just do this nice question. this is a GCSE question from um, Educast or Wedgeck right okay so um, here, I've done some parts of this already in terms of how I would plan now that's the bit that I said I was going to talk mostly about isn't it how I would plan through the question so there's loads of information about what they're doing right okay the pupils are given the following circuit and some additional components to find out something about ohmic um, conductors right so describe that's your command word to start with how the experiment is carried out and how the results should be processed okay to determine whether it's an ohmic resistor right so there's several different parts of the question and we're going to use that to make our little plan. I'm not actually going to answer this, okay, I'm not going to bother writing this one out so it's not going to be too long watching me do that. But now let's have a little think, right? In the order they've given it normally is a kind of indication of a good sequence. Now first thing, okay, they've given some additional components. Well, what additional components do you think you're going to have to use here? Well, it's going to be an ammeter and a voltmeter, isn't it? So the first thing to do, you could actually just add this to the diagram. Okay, an ammeter in series with the thing and a voltmeter across the thermistor, right? Now, you could also put that in sentences. That would probably be my first paragraph, would be ammeter and voltmeter, where they go and what you read out for them, right? 
then describe how the experiment is carried out. This is going to be the second little paragraph, okay, where well, you're going to vary um, what you do, if I missed there, okay, you're going to vary the current through it, okay, you're going to vary the voltage across it, and you're going to measure the voltage and current across it as well, and you're going to record the results of voltage and current, okay. And then how the results should be processed, okay, so then this is about the graph, so three is what you do with the results. Um, you're going to plot a VI graph basically, and you know, if you're doing GCSE, then you'll be familiar with this stuff and you'll be ready to just kind of reel off the Fermister VI graph. And you're going to determine whether it's an ohmic device, is the last part of the question. So you're going to state if it was ohmic, it's going to be a straight line. It's probably not because it's a Fermister. Um, although, whether they're going to get it to high enough temperatures with this just one dry cell, I doubt, right? But anyway, um, now once now you've sort of thought about that with the question to help you think about it, then you just go ahead and write those little paragraphs. And then the last thing you do is you check back, have you covered everything in the question? Okay, now there are clues, aren't there? So what's missing from this is a clue. I'm gonna put a question mark, why not? It's a big clue as to what they're expecting you to do. Um, they've told you about some additional components, that's a big clue as to what they're expecting you to do. And they've told you basically how they expect you to structure this, and the structure is going to be important for the mark scheme. Quick look at the mark scheme just now, okay? This is the indicative content, this is what we're kind of going for. A variable resistor now meter needs to be connected in series with the thermistor and um, the voltmeter connected in parallel. We talked about that, didn't we? We did that. Readings of current voltage are taken, boom. Um, by alternating the variable resistor settings again and again, a number of pairs of readings can be taken, boom. Finally, a graph of current versus voltage should be drawn only if the st straight line is it ohmic. So we've got from the question, we've got to exactly what it said in the mark scheme. Now I know that's GCSE and most of you are A-level, but bear with, okay? So, so if you're GCSE, then I hope that was useful. This is an Edexcel um, GCSE one, okay? And I'm gonna apply the same thing to it. Have a little read. So the battery charger shown in figure 23, it's basically charging uh, batteries. You don't need to see the figure 23 to, to know that. It says the output voltage is this, okay, which is higher than the mains. It's told you the mains, so that's our first kind of part that we're going to tackle. Okay, is going to be how it increases the the um, from the mains to this. It also tells you the mains is AC, and there's a clue in there which is DC. So you should hopefully have noticed there's a difference AC and DC. Well, how does it do that? That could be the second thing that we're going to write about. Aren't they kind to put it in the right order? And then the charging stops if the charging current exceeds 15 amps. So that's going to be my third paragraph. And now explain is what we need to do. So the level it doesn't need to say what it is, it needs to explain how it is and why, why it works, right? How they can be connected together to give this type of output. Ha ha, aren't you thinking straight away that probably a good idea would be to draw yourself a diagram? So actually, I'm going to re revisit this. I'm going to think about, well, how does this work? How does this work? How does this work? I'm going to put it together in a diagram to explain how it, how it um, works. You, can't, you don't need a diagram, but it's useful, isn't it, to draw a diagram that will explain to the examiner exactly what you mean. Okay, so firstly, well, there's going to be some kind of step-up transformer. That's number one, stating that. There needs to be some way of rectifying from AC to DC, as simple as a diode. And there needs to be some type, some type of way of stopping the, the charging current, which could be a fuse, or more likely a circuit breaker, because a circuit breaker is resettable. Okay, so th there, there we go. Those are the different points. And we can put that into a diagram, okay, if we just think about the live and the neutral wire. Um, they're connected to a transformer, basically. Here's my little transformer, look. Um, it's a step up and you don't really need to draw this one but I'm going to draw the second side with more coils just to think about what well, I would write that in my response and then there'd be a diode okay when we on every charge we need to rectify from AC to DC otherwise the kind of, there's no net um, there's, there's no net kind of flow of energy if you like um, all right the, the energy scalar but there's no, there's no correct direction of kind of rearranging those half equations in the chemical cell leave the chemistry out just for now we need a diode to charge up a battery and then here's the battery itself uh, don't think well which way around it should go I'm not too bothered actually um, and then there's the fuse or an RCCB okay I can't I don't can't think of a, a um, circuit symbol for an RCCB, but anyway, that would be that thing there. I could label it RCCB if I wanted to. 
Okay, now that diagram would be useful. Now there's nothing, I know this is a written communication one, but there's nothing to stop you actually giving a diagram or giving algebra or anything like that in your written communication one in physics. So don't be, don't be um, afraid of that. Okay, I think that's uh, a lot. Let's uh, have a little look at what they've put in here. And we've got all this from the question. Um, you know, the sequence of events is voltage change, conversion to direct current, followed by current limiting, which is exactly what we decided to do one, two, and three, and exactly the order in which they've put it. And it basically means a transformer in series with a diode with a circuit breaker, right? Easy peasy. Um, you needed to have the idea that the battery was the thing being charged and not the actual primary part on the transformer. Okay, I'm gonna just pause there and just have a quick look at your chat. Um, I don't know which one you want, you can have the quiet one if you want. Um, I just wanna have a little look yeah, I think um, it's worth just, just you know, I know um, GCSE is not the level that many of you are studying right now, but there are people who watch my channel that are um, GCSE level, so that's kind of for them more than anything. If you're GCSE level now, I'm going to go into A-level stuff, but um, it's still going to be useful. It's still the same idea of decoding it. It probably might take you a little bit further, especially if you're interested in going to A-level next time. Okay, um, and yeah, do you know do you know what else um, about understanding things? Okay, understanding things at a lower level often helps you understand it deeper. So I spend a lot of time teaching physics even to, to year sevens, and the way I have to explain it to year sevens does help me in the way I have to explain it to my A level class because I have to kind of simplify it right down. So when I get that time where somebody doesn't follow my algebra or something like that, then I have a kind of way of explaining it to them. So it is useful. <laughs> I thought that was an easy question. Then I remember it's GCSE. Yeah, you should write continuous prose for um, six mark ones. Okay, think about two or three paragraphs. Okay, that's that is very important. You can write bullet points, um, but we would prefer to do that. Now, often in the mark schemes, as you'll see in the A level, they talk about um, linking the points together. So that does mean kind of continuous prose. Yeah, Mariam, if oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say go get some food, but there'll be sundown soon and you can have your break and your food with your family. Okay. Um, I have a duck called David Duck, if that's what you're getting at, Ryan, but not Donald. Okay. Um, let's. I've got a question for you guys, which is where you were chatting about doing a group chat straight after my feed last time how did that go did it did it work out it was just quite cool that you were kind of using uh, this chat to get together to do some study together i hope that's useful right then um so well you won't fail your gccs if you're preparing dauntless so um just uh look forward to doing a-level physics okay because it's it's a real joy right let's go back into the um you can have the uh, gorilla noise again let's go back into the visual <laughs> And it's not a jump scare if I warned you that it's coming, is it? Okay, so this one is uh, Educas or Wedgec um, A level this time. Okay, now uh, there's loads of Educa Educas A level ones, and I've took I've taken a question um, that's quite long-winded. Okay, but I thought it was worth actually spending the time doing it. Right, um, I thought it was worth spending the time going through it because it's got a really nice written question at the end. It's also got a lot of the things I was talking about yesterday on the live feed where I was talking about. Um, uh, how to work with experiments. Okay, so let's have a little look through it. Basically, you're told about this person that is doing a um, heating up some water, okay, and they're trying to get to a specific heat capacity of the water. So they're going to plot a graph, and their plotting graph as the temperature rises against time. Well, they're going to plot a graph, well, actually, you're going to plot a graph. Okay, so um, here's the graph that I've plotted. Okay, it's really straightforward, actually, this graph. You needed to get a few things kind of right. Um, you needed to get a sensible scale, okay, so just spend a bit of time thinking of that. You need to make sure that you're doing the simple stuff like labeling. And you need to plot, at GCC and A-level, you need to plot to half a small square accuracy. That means having a, a sharp pencil. Now this is my sharp pencil, it's a mechanical pencil. I suggest that you buy and use mechanical pencils for your exams because you won't have to waste time sharpening them. Okay, it needs to be sharp enough. Many GCC students have got such blunt pencils that you can't actually plot to half a small square accuracy, so bear that in mind. First thing to do is actually just plot the points, okay, um, and then it tells you quite clearly plot error bars. So here's where we check always back. Once we've done and we think we're finished with that, maybe we've plotted our points and drawn the straight line of best fit that was really obvious. You see, I haven't drawn a line of best fit on this um, because it didn't tell me to do that. It 
told me to draw a line of maximum gradient and a line of minimum gradient. So this is what we were talking about last night when we were talking about um, worst fit lines, okay, are a useful way for doing an uncertainty in a gradient. So guess what's coming up in the next part? An uncertainty in a gradient. So um, using the plus or minus two degrees, I've put on the vertical error bars and they've told you somewhere here the uncertainty in time is negligible. So it means it's much smaller than any other thing. So we don't need to worry about the uncertainty in time. I don't know how they've managed to measure the uncertainty in time to a negligible uh, you know, amount, but um, there we go. They've told you that, so let's th stick with that. So the line of best, uh, sorry, the line of worst fit with the most gradient is going to be the lowest on this end and the highest possible thing on this end. So you use the error bars to find the, the mo most gradient and then draw that through. And then the line of least gradient is going to be the opposite, the, the highest point at the bottom and the lowest point at the top. Okay, so use the error bars to do that. Okay, there we go, easy peasy. Um, and then, well, it actually goes into talking about hazards. And do you remember this? It was actually the one that Excel chose as well to do the hazards with hot water. And how's this for a mark? Okay, just saying, in fact, in the mark scheme it says like coming into contact with hot water I would prefer to see well it's asking you for the hazard okay not the risk so the hazard is hot water but I'm gonna say skulls with hot water it's just asking you to state look not explain we don't need to actually go into why that's a hazard similarly state a precaution to ensure the accuracy of the water temperature they've told you that it's with a thermometer I believe doesn't actually I don't think anywhere in there but it is with a thermometer you've already guessed that with a plus or minus two degrees okay it's not a bit, even a very high resolution thermometer so if you've got an analog scale you always read the scale at 90 degrees to it and they've actually put at eye level okay I prefer at 90 degrees to the scale and I was going to write to avoid parallax error and I hope that you know this is about parallax error now after watching my video yesterday but um, do you know what like uh, it's not asked us to do that, so the mark is not for explaining it, the mark is not for stay, saying to avoid parallax error, the mark is saying what precaution it should take to do, be accurate. Alright, then I've gone ahead and do the, done the gradients, and um, the gradients, okay, so here's the maximum, I've just used, remember when you do a gradient, use a large triangle, as large as you possibly can, so if it's a straight line, you can extend it through the entire grid, then do that, and use, look, I've used 140, and I've used... Um, the maximum height and worked out the difference in height so it's the rise over the run. Anyway I've done that for the line of most slope and line of least slope, the maximum gradient and the least gradient and hey presto there they are. You didn't need to give the unit but it is useful for later on as well so it's worth whenever you give a gradient give a unit of it, think about what the units would be. This would be degrees Celsius per second okay and um, then moving on calculate the mean gradient with its percentage uncertainty. Now I almost missed that off this time, even though it's bold in the question, I almost didn't calculate a percentage uncertainty. I just thought, well, what else do they want me to do here? So firstly, um, if I look at the mean gradient, I've just added them both together and divided them by two. So 0.69 plus 0.59 divided by two gives us 0.64. And then I've given an uncertainty. One way of doing an uncertainty when we've got results is by doing half the range. So the range is 0.10. So the half the range, the absolute uncertainty is plus or minus 0.05. And again, I put the unit on. But then it's asked us to do the percentage uncertainty. So I just need to do 0.05 of 0.64 and times by 100 to give us 7.8%. Okay. I hope this is all making sense so far. So I'll get in the um, I'll get in the chat uh, in, uh, after I've done this and the next question. Okay, hence use the mean gradient to calculate the specific heat capacity of water and its absolute uncertainty. So here we go. Use the mean gradient to calculate and calculate its absolute uncertainty. So there's three marks and one of them is going to be for the absolute uncertainty. So let's think about it. Here we have to do a bit of derivation and I did a whole live feed on derivation if you didn't see that guys and girls then check that one out it's from a few days ago really good I went through loads of derivations okay so this is a derivation skill here you could have done it a slightly different way they often like to do this okay when when you haven't got you know what you're expecting for a um, specific heat capacity calculation energy is m times specific heat capacity times delta t change in temperature you haven't got a change in temperature what you've got is a temperature per second a delta t over time in other words right and they haven't given you an energy they've given you a power 
So what do you know about power? Well, power is energy over time. So essentially, you can just derive this bad boy into there and make that delta T over T, uh, the rate of change of um, temperature, which is what we've got. Okay, so we're going to use that gradient, and rather than think about rearranging all this, I've just done it the simple old school way. Put the numbers in, being careful with my units. Can you check the skills? Okay, just chucking in, chucking in a, a K just there. Okay, times 10 to the 3. Put all the other numbers in that I know, the mass and my gradient, which is delta T over T here, and then rearranged, and I've come out of what you'd expect for heat capacitive water to be. Um, somewhere around 4,200 4, joules per kilogram per degree C. And now I've only got, I think, two marks so far because I haven't calculated the absolute uncertainty. So this, um, I don't actually agree with this as being the absolute uncertainty of that um, measure because we haven't considered the uncertainty of the power or the uncertainty of the mass of water. But um, the, they've kind of, you know, the they haven't they should have stated something like that the uncertainty of the power and the mass is negligible as well and they probably would if this had been reviewed but i think this is a specimen yes yeah, a specimen so um look out for things like that okay actually what you probably should have done is used half uh, you know the next kind of digit um the the level of precision they've given it to you as an indication of the uncertainty that they've given but we can just use our 7.8%, um, okay? Our uncertainty, percentage uncertainty being, sorry, 7.8% or 0 0.078. Multiply that by our calculated value of split heat capacity and boom, that's the, um, the absolute uncertainty is plus or minus 324 joules per kilogram per degree C. Now, I'll show you the mark scheme after I've done this briefly, but you can imagine there'll be a range there because we've used gradients and things like that where there's a, there's a kind of allowable kind of slight plotting um, average, right? Okay, so uh, the next bit, and this is where the quality rate communication comes in. And there's loads of this in the WEDGEC, okay? I feel for you if you're doing the WEDGEC because there's loads of kind of long written pages without questions that you have to kind of digest. This is about um, the s a second student's data which we're comparing to the first student's data. So I'll come back to this in a second. Right? We've printed that out again for us for some reason. Right, and this is the actual question. So without further calculation, so you know it's not about calculation, um, and by comparing the results of both students, okay, so that's something that we need to remember to do and check back afterwards, compare, suggest, that's our first command word, valid conclusions for the second student's experiment, evaluate the second student's results critically. So it's not asking us to evaluate the first students, it's about asking us to evaluate the second students. Okay, so... That basically is your two paragraphs, isn't it? The first paragraph is suggest valid conclusions. Your second paragraph is evaluate. So here's right back from the start, remember, plan and check. Okay, that's not the one. Plan and check. When you're doing the longer written ones, plan your answer before you start writing and check it at the end with the question. Both of those things, planning and the checking, comes from the question, not from the answer you've given. Okay, so um, here's the conclusions. Firstly, my first little paragraph. Um, the second student's line is not straight. Did you notice that when you just flashed up? The first student's was. It has a decreasing gradient. Okay, so it's not straight. How is it not straight? Is it an increasing gradient or is it a decreasing gradient? It's a decreasing gradient. Get the extra detail in there. As the gradient is not constant and is lower than the first student, it will give a higher value for specific heat capacity. Now, the um, the mark scheme says lower. Now, if you can correct me by the end, but I'm pretty sure that that would give you a higher value of specific heat capacity. Because if you look at where the gradient is on the calculation, the gradient is in the lowest part, and uh, you know, on the uh, bottom line of the fraction. So C would be higher. Pretty darn sure I'm right about that. You let me know. If not, I would trust maths before I trust a mark scheme. Okay, um, as the gradient is not constant, give a higher value, it's a lower value of gradient, so I'll give a higher value of specific heat capacity. So that, this is my conclusions. All of the values of temperature are lower, but the student had the same starting temperature. Okay, that's another conclusion. Now I'm moving into the evaluative part here. This suggests the container used by student 2 was less well insulated than the first. So in other words, it's giving out more heat to the surroundings than the first one because it's a lower gradient. It's not increasing at the same rate. Okay, 
Um, furthermore, the student's gradient decreases. I'm linking, look how this is linked to the last bit. The student's gradient decreases, therefore more heat is being dissipated to the surroundings because of a larger temperature difference here than is here. Okay, and that's getting in, this is actually thermodynamics 2, okay, the rate of heat loss is proportional to a temperature difference. The student should repeat with more insulation to get closer to the expected trend. So the last thing to do in evaluation is what do you do next? And this student should repeat with more insulation to get closer to the expected trend, which was that straight line that the first student got. So I might actually add that in there because when I'm checking back now, I'm thinking, right, have I compared the results of both? Yeah, I have done some comparisons here. I might want to put it like, like this one here. The expected trend, which is a straight line, which the first student got. Boom. All right. Okay. Um, and then, have I suggested valid conclusions? Yeah, I've done loads of conclusions. Have I evaluated? Yes, I've evaluated. And as you're going through, and as you'll see in the examples later on, might just add words if you think that they need extra words. Right. I hope that was helpful. Just a quick flash up of the mark scheme, especially if you want to pause it or look back later on if you weren't sure what I was chatting about. Here's the, um, the hazards and things and the, the precaution for accuracy. Here's the max and minimum gradients, okay, with the little range that they've allowed. I was um, pretty much just a little bit higher on both of these, I think, a little bit higher on this one, a little bit lower on this one. And so my mean gradient was exactly that, but um, they've allowed a range, and my percentage of uncertainty was close to the maximum of their range, okay? Um, so be, be aware of that. And then this is the calculation bit here. Okay, basically figuring out where to put your gradient in that equation. And then um, this is the conclusions and the evaluations, the kind of typical marking points that they would give you for that quality of written communication question. Right, one more, this one's from an Edexcel paper one. Okay, that was from uh, Educast paper one as well, Wedge paper one. Uh, so it'd be useful for you on Monday. Thumbs up for Monday. Like the video, okay, share it out, please, everybody, right? If you didn't wedgeck, you pronounce every letter. Right? I, I will pronounce wedgeck how I want to pronounce wedgeck. All right, but yeah, okay, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. I have, right, um, W J E C. Right, apologies. Um, okay, so this one asks us to explain how the cyclotron, and they're giving us a diagram of cyclotron, produces high energy proton beam, and then they're giving you some bump about high energy proton beams, okay, and you're looking around for kind of clues as to what this might be. It doesn't have a kind of do this and do this, okay, um, it asks just to explain how it produces this high energy beam out of the end. So how do the, does the particles gain energy as it goes around the cyclotron? So this is really, this is pretty much just a reel off, a set explain of how a cyclotron works, but there's nice clues in here are the things they haven't put on the diagram. Okay, you often see on the diagram, you see the little kind of annotated AC across these two Ds. So there's an alternating potential difference between them, and that's our first kind of thing that we might, what, might want to write about. They haven't put the magnetic field, which is at right angles and up, if you like, through the plane of the cyclotron. They haven't put that on the diagram, so that would be a useful thing for us to have in our explanation. And lastly, they haven't talked, they haven't indicated this kind of centripetal force or mv squared over r, which is equal to the magnetic um, field by Fleming's left hand rule, the BQV force, okay, which is our, one of our standard kind of derivations, which you can just obviously knock one of those v's off. And you can see that greater v needs to have a greater r because b is fixed, okay, in a cyclotron, remember the b field is fixed. And also the frequency of um, AC is fixed as well. Okay, so if V increases, R must increase. V is proportional to R is the other th thing that we should probably get into this. Okay, so now you didn't spot the maths question maybe when you first read that, but there is always going to be some mathematical comparisons going on in physics, right? Okay, so firstly, I'm going to talk about the alternating potential difference. Here we go. There's an alternating potential difference between the two Ds. This is a fixed frequency, okay, which is one of the things I just remember and is really important about how a cyclotron works. Um, the protons are accelerated. Okay, uh, This is the thing. How does it gain energy? Well, they're accelerated by the electric field between the Ds. So they're accelerated as they jump across the little gaps, essentially. All right, hope that makes sense. 
There is a magnetic field perpendicular, that's my B field, this is my second paragraph look. Um, perpendicular to the plane of these, this causes a force by right angles by Fleming's left hand rules. This is a centripetal force. Okay, so as soon as you've said that, you're thinking mv squared over r. Okay, um, and the protons accelerate in a circular path. The last thing to talk about is as the speed of the protons increases, the radius of the path increases too. So that's the v being proportional to r. And um, this means that for each semicircular path, uh, sorry, the time for each semicircular path is fixed, allowing the frequency of AC to be fixed as well. So that's the last point there. And then what we do after we've written the thing is check back, have we done all that we planned to do? And if we haven't done all the plan, we can just insert little asterisks or whatever and write it down at the bottom, or insert extra words to, you know, if we haven't said that it's a centripetal force, we'll just put force, or if we haven't put Fleming's left hand rule, we might just insert a little FLHR, you know, Fleming's left hand rule. We know what that is, you can still write that in a quality ring communication question. So check back and add any details that you think you might have left out. Well, I hope that was helpful. We, um, yeah, here's the mark scheme just to, to do that a little bit simpler. Just want to draw your attention before you do that about the kind of extra marks they give you in Excel. Okay, and this is worth thinking about structure and linking. Okay, the answer shows coherent and logical structure with linkage, fully sustained lines of reasoning demonstrated throughout. And that's worth an extra two points. So that was a very detailed answer that I gave. But if you only got four of those points, four of those six points just there, and they were well linked together, you can still get six out of six marks on this six mark question. I'm going to have a little pause and going to look at the chat again. So um, I don't know which one do you want. You can have the quiet one. <clears throat> okay. You like Wedgeck? I'll, I'll go. I'll carry on with Wedgeck, uh, Aob. Yeah. Um, yeah, Monday, and don't stress out about it, guys. Just go in there and do your best. You seem like you're really on it. Uh, what's your views on my teacher pronounces? Lun as line, very strange. I, I don't know. Natural logarithm is what we all should really say, but we all just shorten it to Lun, don't we? I have no views on this. As long as you understand what your teacher is telling you, then that's fine. I hope you remember this live stream when you're at 1 million subs. Yeah, I need more shares, though. I need more shares. I need more people to, um, I don't know, not worry about seeming cool. Oh, look, they're sharing out a, a physics YouTube channel. But just I need more shares to help me get up to that kind of target. Fascinating. Derivation videos, yeah, they're really useful. Um, go back for that. Bum, 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 bum. I'm glad, Shakib, they, they're, they're useful too, buddy. All right. How, how to calculate percentage uncertainty in anything. So it's the difference over the actual measurement. Okay, it's just simple as that. It's the absolute uncertainty, which we represent by delta whatever, delta x, let's say, over the actual value of x, the, the value you've measured. Okay, and the uncertainty is normally going to be, if, you, if, you're, if you're estimating the uncertainty, then it comes from half a scale division. But if you've got a set of repeats, then you can use half the range of those repeats for your absolute uncertainty. So there's two ways to calculate percentage uncertainty. I get PTSD from that gorilla. Sorry, Ryan, I warned you. I warned you. Do I need to? Maybe I need to do like a little bit lower volume on that one. And um, let's move on. So now, next thing I've got is exemplars given to us by the exam board, right? So um, stay clean to this. I'll give you the, the quiet one. OCRA doesn't do cyclotron accelerators, and I hope, hope not. But this is about decoding the questions. I hope it's still useful for you. All right. Okay, so um, this is an exemplar from paper one of Edexcel, and there's three exemplar questions. But the nice thing is not the understanding the question, but it's understanding what the um, examiners have actually said about the people who have done this question. So this one, you know, is fine. Actually, it's a correct calculation, and so it does get the full marks, right? But if this person had done this one wrong, then they would not get the full marks, right? So this is calculate the average force. So what we really wanted to see was something like delta F is delta, uh, sorry, sigma F is uh, delta P over T, okay? And then some correct things subbed in. I think this is the mass times the velocity, is it? Yeah, <clears throat> to give us the momentum, okay? So something like delta P equals, okay? And then 
sum of the forces equals this. Now, the reason for that is for this mark in the mark scheme, which is use of. All right, see this mark use of. Okay, now you get the mark use of F equals MA, okay, which is, or F equals delta MV over T, which is delta P over T. Then um, you get the mark use of if we see the equation and we see some, some things that are correct subbed in, like, so you've got a time in the right place and you've got a mass in the right place, but you've written the velocity wrong or something like that. All right, so make sure you pick up the use of um, marks, okay, it's not just for recognizing the equation to use, it's for, um, it's for actually showing the equation that you're using with some values subbed in. So let's say, I don't know, that you'd convert it to grams for some reason here. Then you, um, you would still get the use of mark even though your final force would be um, a thousand, a factor of a thousand off. Then this person's also done some good skills. Remember with the calculation skills, identify what you've got, look at their SUVAT skills, okay, standard. Um, and then they've picked an equation from that, done all the things and made a little point here. Okay, so um, the important point here here is um, this person has done the statement at the end. So this is a six mark calculation, which is a new type of calculation in all the exam boards and in GCSEs. Whenever it says something like this, determine whether the ball hits the ground within this distance, the final mark, the sixth mark, is for this statement, which is basically comparing your result to the, the value that you've been given um, when they in the, on the diagram of the tennis net, right? So moving on, this one's a little bit better. They're saying because this one does give you examples of what they're doing. So even if this value was wrong, they would get a use mark for showing what they've done here. Uh, this one, however, um, doesn't get the last one. Okay, it, um, it doesn't get the final mark here because it just says it does hit the ball within the distance. It doesn't say this is less than a distance. Yeah, it doesn't say, look, this is the distance they've calculated it needs to be less than, but it doesn't say 17.85 is less than 18.1 metres. Right? Sorry. Um, so just stay in that, either in algebra like that, or, um, you know, by saying that um, by in words, then that gets you the last mark. So this only got 5 out of 6, even though all the calculation was perfectly correct. Next one, again annotate it what is this it's still correct okay it's not bad if you want to do that but cover yourself to get as many marks as possible and the last one um, you can still get that last mark right this doesn't get the last mark it doesn't go over the net okay it doesn't get the last mark because it doesn't say this is less than the 12 meters to the net okay so you can still even if your calculation is wrong this person has said that it's actually slowed down in the x dimension. It's, it's, it's talked about there being an acceleration in the x dimension, okay, um, rather than in projectiles, we just assume there's no acceleration or change in velocity in the x dimension, only acceleration in the y. Um, but you sh they would have got the mark. It said, Since 8.87 is less than 12, it doesn't pass over the net. So you can still get this sixth mark for these types of calculation. It doesn't have to be a six marker, by the way. Um, don't, don't take that away. But you can still get the mark. If it says determine or if it says assess or something like that, it's looking for a little concluding statement at the end. Okay, um, this one is a question about uh, Millikan's oil drop, is it? No, it's not. It's just what it looks like. But it's about um, a falling electron. Oh no, it is Millikan's oil drop. But charged oil drops, okay, are falling um, through two charged plates. And you've got to basically consider the forces to figure out, um, explain the motion in terms of the forces. So it's another quality of written communication one. It's another one with a little asterisk. Here it is. Again, planning and then checking. So plan with the question, check with the question. Okay. So what we're going to do, explain is our command word. Make sure we get that underlined so we know exactly what type of thing there. It's not just state, it's explain. The motion of the oil drops in terms of the forces, and that's my first paragraph, what are the forces on the oil drop basically acting on it when the PD is increased from zero to V. And V is the potential difference, I believe, when it stops moving, where we've got it kind of stationary, in other words, the forces are balanced yet. Yeah. Observe that a particular PD, the oil drop stops falling and remains stationary between the two plates. So you have to um, v is the potential difference whereby it is there's no resultant force and it's not moving at all. Okay, so um, 
this person okay doesn't have a good structure and doesn't have a good planning okay um they they do get three marks okay because they've made two relevant points in here somewhere probably not going to go through it i'll go through the one that's, that's most correct if you like um but they do also get they've made two relevant points somewhere in there and they get a third mark because they've considered some structure okay maybe they've done force maybe they've talked about yeah look they've talked about zero volts at the start and as it's increased towards v there's more of an upwards force there we go. boom okay next one okay this one is quite a good one okay but they make this kind of um, common error when we're talking about forces link forces to accelerations okay so forces cause accelerations or resultant forces do anyway that's newton's second law and i always like to to play spot the newton's law question right if you what i mean by that is get newton's laws in there in your explains that we're looking for you to be able to apply that newton's laws across so this one is actually quite a good response except in the fact they talk about the forces but they don't talk about any acceleration so it's initially falling at zero volts and then it's accelerated to a stop okay moving on um this one Again, oh, there isn't a good example for this one. We'll go back to the mark scheme if you like, just just quickly. A uh, student is unable to explain the motion. The, the oil drop achieves marking point two for reference to an upwards force of electrostatic attraction. There is linking of ideas, though, so they get an extra mark for linking the ideas. So think about that as being a little bonus mark. Okay, if you can link two things or one thing that's relevant to something else that's relevant, then um, you're going to get yourself a mark. Here's the indicator of content. So here, here just so that you've uh, got something for Millikan's oil drop experiment. So at terminal velocity, the forces on the drop are balanced or weight equals drag, basically. Okay, so that's when it's falling. Okay, that's terminal velocity. Um, the PD creates an electrostatic force acting upwards on the drop. Okay, so there's a, there is an, another force going upwards on the drop. The electrostatic force increases as PD increases. Remember that zero to V. The net upward force causes the drop to have a negative acceleration, linking force to acceleration and talking about the direction of it. As speed decreases, the drag decreases. Okay, so that drag force is going away. And then the drop remains stationary when the forces are balanced or until when the drop remains stationary where weight is equal to electrostatic force. So did you spot it was a terminal velocity question? I imagine that most of those people didn't. And basically, so initially we've got uh, weight and drag being equal. Drag is proportional to speed and a new force, an electrostatic force, um, call it the E-force, uh, comes into play. And that, additional to the drag initially, means that E plus D is greater than weight. So there's a net force. So there is a acceleration upwards, right? Um, not, not good algebra. Um, uh, but then finally, the electrostatic force is equal to the weight. And once more, Newton's first law is satisfied. There's no resultant force, so there's no acceleration. Okay, then back to derivation bits here, look. Okay, the oil drop has mass m. Show that the mass, so sorry, show the charge on the oil drop is given by Q equals mg d over v. Now, here's the clue for the derivation. Look, you've got mg in there. Here's the other clue from the de uh, derivation. You've got z and d in a fraction together. So this person has gone and found um, weight being equal to mg over here. Use that in there. And they've also found that electric in electric field, V over D is equal to F over Q. So they've basically put MG in there instead of F. Look, boom, rearrange for Q, and that's the equation derived. This is clear and logical sequence, so it's, or it's awarded both marks in this case. This one, um, I think, did they get... No, it's not awarded any marks, okay. So, although this student apparently arrives at the correct thing, okay, well, they've been told the correct thing, so they can kind of just write down the correct thing. They haven't really told us the steps, look, W, or work done, that is, okay. So, if they've got something like work done is force times distance equals MGD, then maybe they would get that mark there. But the examiner hasn't been able to follow their line of reasoning. 
So very important, right? Now, actually, by putting these equations next to it, or the equations that the examiner was intending them to use, they're going to get those use of equations marks. So if you've written down the equation and then you've used it, you're going to get that use of equations mark, right? It's very important the examiner can follow your working. This example is a clear sequence with written clarification, so they've actually put their steps uh, that they've done just there. Okay. Next one, um, part C now. What would happen to the oil drop if the PD is increased further? Look what they've got in there. They've got the word accelerate. Okay, but they don't compare the forces. They don't say that now um, the upwards force would be greater than the weight, so it's going to accelerate upwards. Think Newton two. Spot the Newton's laws question. Okay, explain what would happen if the oil drop the PD is increased further. Experience a net upwards force and then accelerates upwards. So they've got the accelerate. And they've said net upwards force, but they haven't compared the forces. And it states what would happen if the PD is increased further. So the PD is now greater than the weight. Okay, also the electrostatic force is greater than the weight. So there's a resultant force. And this one, still only gets one, I think, correctly compares the forces, but hasn't. So it says it starts to move rather than accelerates. We really hate that starts to move thing. Okay, because we understand Newton's laws. So the PD is increased further, the order will begin to move upwards, so all they needed to change was that. Which is why in written questions you check through your answer and you think about upgrading your language, getting that extra detail in there. Because the upward force due to electrostatic force would be greater than the downwards force today. We could have also said weight, but it didn't need to. Last kind of example our question. Um, and then I'll talk about where you find these and how you use these. Okay, um, this is about an electron gun, and you can actually cause electrons to uh, go in a uh, circular path. More question. We'll come back to this. This question is all printed here. Show that a magnetic, the, sorry, the unit of magnetic flux density, Tesla, is in SI base units, kilograms per amps per second squared. Um, okay, so this has been a case of finding an equation for Tesla. A final equation which involves Tesla, rearranging it for magnetic fields, okay, which is um, Tesla is the unit of that, and then defining the um, units of F, defining I, defining L, and then banging them all in and doing the cancelling, and there we go. So this is a really nice example. They like this one, okay. It identifies all the units before substituting them and cancelling. So the work is easy to follow. Now what I like about this one is often when I think about using these kind of written boxes to do my algebra, which kind of annoys me that they don't just give me more space to do my algebra, I think about doing two columns. So you can see this one's quite nice because they've done the um, algebra, the quantities on one side and the units on the other side. Okay, so think about, you know, work, work down one side then down the other side to kind of double up the space you've got for your algebra. But So that's a good little tip for algebra, I think. Show the unit of magnetic flux density. To, oh, this is the same question, of course. It still scores two marks, right? And I think this is quite neat. But they what they want you to cover yourself for the marks. They want you to do what the previous student did by saying F equals this, I equals this, and L equals this. Now, in, in reality, they've still done that because they're in the same place in this equation as they're in this equation. So it still gets the two marks, but it's saying it would be helpful. They'd like you to identify these before you put them in. This one's all a bit of a muddle. Okay, although they do kind of get somewhere at the end. Now the mark they get is actually for this little bit here, where the start they started correctly, get into too much of a muddle. Um, they can't follow the thing. They've uh, you know they've made some mistake in here somewhere. It's not too bad, is it? Yeah, they just don't get there, do they? They don't get to the. Yeah, but the mark they've given before is for correctly defining what a unit of charge is as an amp per second. Okay, so the student fudges, so they, they think they've kind of made a, a skip. They haven't shown this cancellation, maybe. All right, so show that cancellation. So only score one mark, harsh. But examiners are harsh because we, we need to distinguish between the A stars and the uh, A's. So the magnetic force acting on the electron is perpendicular to the direction of its velocity, what we're talking about here. Why do they follow a circular path? As soon as you're thinking circular path, you're thinking about centripetal forces, you're thinking, if you're thinking about particles following circular paths, you're thinking BQV, you're thinking Fleming's left-hand rule, okay, um, and yeah, so on and so forth. 
Shooting correctly first of magnetic force acting perpendicular to V, scoring by point one, and they talk about centripetal force, but they don't really define what a centripetal force by saying that the force is towards the center of a circle. So they haven't got this point here. If you recognize circular path, you get these two mark marking points for free. It's a centripetal force, which is a resultant force, if you like, towards the center of the circle. Same here, still um, still two marks, didn't get the towards the centre of the circle bit, so remember that for you explaining circular path bits. And this one is a really important thing, going back to my planning and checking point from these written questions. If you check back, right, and you check back the question, then you recognise that they haven't actually described anything to do with circular motion. Right, if you look through this, there is nothing to do, it says there's a right angles, fine, so they do gain the marking point, the first marking point, but they haven't, with the question, the indication they should be talking about circular path, so it's centripetal force, which is towards the center of the circle. And lastly, and this is using um, percentage uncertainty again, so somebody asked about percentage uncertainty again. Um, and I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna look back to the chat briefly at the end and talk about what's coming up for the next couple of days as well. Um, Okay, so this one they've given you a column. How did you get? How did you work out what to calculate in that last column? They say analyze the data and comment on this suggestion. The suggestion is the radius of the electron path is inversely proportional to the magnetic flux density. So that means that radius and mag flux density multiplied together would be a constant. B R equals uh, B R equals a constant. All right. Um, or obviously B is inversely proportional to R, but rearrange that gives you this statement here. So the thing you can calculate using these pairs of data is a constant BR. Um, analyze the data and comment on this suggestion. You may use the table to show any calculated value, value. So if it says you may do something, you should do that. Um, so you get a mark just for doing correct calculated values actually. And how are you going to comment on whether this suggestion is, is correct? Well, the answer is that you're going to um, see whether they are the same within the experimental uncertainty. Right, so how do we do that? So basically, we, we, um, we use, in this case, because we've got a set of repeated data, we use half the range and divide it by the mean and gives it 1.2%. <coughs> <clears throat> so, because it's a low percentage uncertainty, it implies the relationship is correct, right? Now, you can actually do a little bit better than that. You can actually say that all of these are within 1.2% of each other. And that means, basically, you think about the experiments like this, think about uncertainty like this. Is the final result within the percentage uncertainty? If it is, then it's a success. If it's not, then it's not a success. So an experiment is successful if the percentage difference, okay, or essentially a percentage difference from a true value is within the percentage uncertainty. We can only measure things within our experimental uncertainty. And if we get a successful experiment, it means that our percentage difference is less than our percentage uncertainty. Make sense to you? So basically, if these all fall within the percentage uncertainty, which they do, um, then they are within this experiment. They are the same value. They are not different values, although they are different numbers. They are not different values. All right. Um, yeah, they all fall. Sorry, within the percentage uncertainty of the mean, I should say. And right, how this person has uh, calculated the values, but they've only got one mark. Therefore, okay, they they've commented on. Oh, okay, so it is a constant. Okay, they're roughly similar, but he's asked us to do a bit more analysis than that. So if you think about that, well, what clue is it that you have to do percentage uncertainty? It might be the significant figures. Look, they've given us they've given us 11 point naught. Why have they given us three sig figs in this case? Because they're telling us that we know that to three significant figures. They're telling us that this is about uncertainty within this. Okay, I think it's a little bit vague where they've got this and why they haven't given us much of um, they haven't given us much indication that we should be using uncertainties but if you're asked to comment on suggestions be thinking is the experiment within percentage uncertainty you've got to think though right okay for just doing rb and commenting that they're basically the same 
it's not going to be worth four marks. So think, where are the other marks in this question from? And you've got to think, well, all right, okay, now I've seen some of these. I know that percentage uncertainty is a really big thing in these new syllabus, so I'm going to bother to do that. And again, this person's figured out the right thing, but then their statement is just, just weak, so they get the correct, they get the calculation mark, but nothing else. Right, I hope that's, uh, I'm just going to now go ahead and look for one last time at the chat. Um, I'm going to keep it quiet for you guys because you've been upset with me that I'm, I've been doing jump scares. <clears throat> People talking about Amazon Prime, a Tim Star ruler, is that the one with the kind of um, the, the thing in the middle and you can see either side, it's translucent, you can see either side? Yeah, it's bo boxes so you can judge how far the lines were from the point. Yeah, they're pretty good, okay? You can do it with any ruler though, you're A-level students. Often in plotting questions, when it asks for the gradient, I always find myself getting a value just outside the range on the mark scheme. Help. It's probably um, doing a tangent. Okay, it's probably doing a tangent, and um, th that's where a ruler like the Tim Star ruler would be really useful. When you do a tangent, okay, think about the curve. I'll just go back to the um, visualizer quickly. If you've got a line like this, right, and you want a tangent at this point here, then you need to basically line up the ruler, line up a point on the ruler, I'll use 15, why not, and look maybe three centimeters away from it either side and make sure that this gap is the same as this gap and this is what these chaps are talking about when they're talking about using this Tim Star ruler because it's translucent so you can see with little squares you can basically make a square fit at the same point either side and that will give you an accurate tangent okay and then when you read off the values just be really careful that the range is um, derived from half a small square plotting accuracy so basically your gradient needs to be accurate to half a small square at both ends. You've got to be really accurate with those, okay, just practice a few. We'll go back to the chat. Is it is it called Tim Star? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure you're allowed to take them in, in the exam. Amazon Prime, definitely. It's not an Amazon, oh dear. Yeah, clear rulers, useful. Any predictions? No, I, Sam, I wouldn't even bother trying to predict things, okay? It was still young in the syllabus. The only time you could really predict something is if they haven't covered something in the entire length of the syllabus until then, and it was the last year of the, the syllabus, because they legally have to cover everything in the assessments throughout the entire syllabus. So actually, um, any attempt to kind of uh, to, to predict what's going to come up is going to be flawed. Just do your best to cover everything that you can, make sure you know what you know, um, think about working on those last few days on the bits that you find the hardest, and uh, I'm sure you do absolutely fine. Okay, it's, it's not about getting every single mark, although you're going to try and get every single mark, it's about just getting um, enough to get your grade, right? Just do your best. And besides, like with the multiple choice is a way of covering a lot of stuff, so that's the way that they make sure they do, even if it's only worth one mark, they make sure they cover everything in the in the spec. Yeah, it does, percentage uncertainty always comes up, okay, it's a really big deal in the new one. It's going to be mainly coming up in the, um, it's going to be mainly coming up in the paper three, yeah, but there you go. Why does the range have to be halved? So it's basically saying that if you calculate the mean, then the maximum possible thing could be half the range away in either direction. Okay, it's just a, a kind of shortcut. So we know what the range is going to be. We're not going to say that we're going to be like plus or minus the whole range because we know that's a range around a mean average. One of my top tips for evaluation questions. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, if you watch my last live feed yesterday, then I talked through evaluative points for all the core practicals. And basically, if you learn all those, then you're going to have the ammunition to do any evaluation question that comes up. But um, the other thing I have, if you look back in Guerrilla Physics, if you type Guerrilla Physics, how to do how to write evaluations, then then there's like a 10 minute video where I, or less than actually, where I go through how to write an evaluation, which is basically how you do evaluation questions in the exam. Right, I've just got a couple more things to say to you, um, and I'll just, yeah, I'll do that uh, with this camera, because why not? I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play the music.
Okay, so um, just to say to you now, really, that was all about decoding the six mark and the longer written questions. Okay, think about it, um, how to write a little plan using the question and check your answer using the question. Okay, in the description, then there's a really good, there's three long ones from um, Edexcel A level. Look at the way that I plan the answer and then use that to structure the answer and then go back to that plan and to the question to check my answer. Okay, there's a GCSE one in there as well. Um, also, so that was a, um, examiner's exemplars with some commentary of why students did or didn't get the, the answers. Use what are called examiner's reports. Now, you're the second year through these A-levels, so go get examiner's reports, okay? Get them Monday morning if you can, if you can't find them because you can't download them, okay? But I'm sure if you find examiner's reports of 2017 and look through what the examiners are saying that students can and can't do because the smart people are going to be the ones who are going to do a little bit better than last year's students did. So that was an example of basically an examiner's report, but they were, weren't from an actual exam that was sat. They were from some kind of uh, test uh, students and people using them with, just with their class probably and kind of compiling them and discussing them what's going to be allowed and what's not and what tips they can give to you. So they are tips to give to you. Um, in the next couple of days, on Saturday, I am going to uh, go through some of the hardest questions on paper one. I'm going to be talking about Bloom's taxonomy and what makes a question hard. And um, on the night before the exam, Sunday night, I'm just going to pop up for a bit. Oh, actually, no, I'm doing something interesting. I'm going to do, I'm going to follow uh, A Level Physics Online, and then he's going to follow me, and then I'm going to follow him. So we're going to kind of dovetail our feeds to allow us a bit of time to plan responses to any questions that you have. Um, so drop in on Sunday night if you just want to ask questions, and basically we'll just be responding to things that you want to hear about on su uh, Sunday night. So some more questions coming at you next time and how to work out the kind of level of response. Just really quickly back into the visualizer then um, because I just want to talk about some things that I actually got wrong in yesterday's live feed um, and I just didn't want to leave them. Basically yesterday I was almost all ready, okay, I just wanted to go through the algebra quickly with a few of the questions to make sure that I didn't make any silly mistakes and then um, baby Florence needed, needed a wee bottle so it was very nice but um, meant that I was a bit rushed and I rushed this one here where I was talking about G by free fall experiment and I was talking about um, how to resolve it into a straight line with G as the gradient and basically I um, basically I just rearranged it in the wrong direction I know why I did that now okay which I'll talk about in a second so this is what it should have looked like it was V squared over 2s okay because basically this is already Y equals MX plus C y being the uh, v squared, c being the u squared, but of course we're starting from zero, so it should go through the origin. We shouldn't really need that, it should be zero. And uh, the gradient being a leaves x as 2s. Okay, so that was really quite straightforward, and I'm annoyed at myself that I didn't, that I made that mistake on the video. At least I'm correcting it now. And this is why, because I remembered 2s being on the y-axis, because if you use this um, setup and you actually measure a distance when you drop and you measure a time between that distance, okay, rather than in this case where we're measuring a final speed at the bottom of a distance, um, then you rearrange it like this. So basically times both sides by 2, get rid of the ut first because u is 0, um, times both sides by 2 gives you 2s, um, which is the y term and then m is the uh, acceleration and x is the t squared so forgive me i made a mistake and then the last one the last mistake i made i put um the uh, specific heat capacity of raising the temperature of the ice the energy to raise the temperature of the melted ice on the wrong side of the equation so here's my correction here for myself so basically the, the ice is in the water and it rate no it lowers the temperature of the water so this energy from the kind of um, room temperature water is used to melt the ice and to raise the temperature of the water which was ice. So basically expand that to be specific heat capacity equation for the water um, with a change in temperature being the starting temperature uh, take away the final temperature. Okay, once the ice has been in and it's all melted. Then this is our target, this is the one we wanted to calculate for the thing, the specific latent heat of ice which is the mass of the ice times that plus the energy to bring that now zero degrees water which is melted up to the same temperature as the water so that, that is um, the final temperature uh, take away zero basically all right okay so so you can rearrange that and you will get l equals blah 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 now this 
C. This is the fudge of this experiment because it implies knowledge of C being 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree C. All right, so don't rush your algebra. Check back. If you're doing a video in the middle of the exam, then you might be more likely to make mistakes. I hope um, that you're all doing okay. Keep working hard, okay, and I will catch you... Um, I will catch you on the flip side. I will catch you tomorrow for some of the hardest questions on paper one. Probably not quite as long as this because I'm going to be start to be busier again. I did some GCSE stuff, Viraj, at the start. Okay. Um, can you go for OCR, Astro, and Cosmo stuff, please? I'm probably. I might look at. The, is that in tomorrow? Is that in Monday's paper, uh, Miriam? I might look at that. Um, Yes, you can write N1, N2, or FL, HR in your answers. Okay, we know what they they are. They're accepted terms for those. Um, you might want to write them in words. Write them in words for like longer written ones. I suggest, but it's, it's still acceptable. Yeah, it's fine. And that's about it. All right. Chat to you later, dudes.